put on this computer. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to our September edition of the Artist Talk series of 2023. Um, this is our Young Artist Showcase um, featuring um, Camila, is it Geraldo? Geraldo? Geraldo, okay, thanks, sorry. Not I didn't clarify that with you. <laughs> Camila Geraldo, Charlie Blode, and Cosette Ellis, um, who are all super rock stars in their craft and are also in the early 20s phase of their lives. Um, so we're really excited to share y'all's work. And um, they're also all here or have been here as part of the Alchemy Art Center um, Visiting Artist Program or Artists in Residence Program. Um, which is a seasonal program that we do every year where we invite people to apply to an open call to come and be residents uh, at Alchemy Art Center on San Juan Island. And we're about to open our call for that on October 1st for next year. So if you know anybody who you think would be a good fit at Alchemy or, or on San Juan Island or is a really cool artist who you think would have really cool skills to share with the community, that would be really cool to know about them. So please have them check out our website starting on October 1st. And with that, I'm going to welcome Camila, our first speaker. Hey, hello. Um, so yeah, my name is Camila Geraldo. Um, I'm a mixed media artist, um, but I mainly focus on ceramics. Um, I was born and raised in Chicago, uh, but I am of Colombian heritage. And so, um, yeah, that informs a lot of my work. Um, my presentation will be mostly chronological um, and I'll be mostly focusing on my like journey with ceramics and a little bit of like photography. Um, but yeah, I'll get started. So, do I? Oh, yeah, just go forward on the. Yeah. Just this guy should be that. Wait, why is that working? I don't know. Oh, it's always, <laughs> always, always, like, no, it's <laughs> always fine. It's always um, fine. Oh, yeah, yeah. Yes. Oh, it's okay. Yes. Just click yes. it. Yeah. <laughs> okay. Um, it's just that. We did it. Cool. So, um, I actually just before coming here, I found this little frog and its baby uh that I made probably it's like one of the first things I've ever made I don't know I was probably like eight or something and it just like brought me so much joy and um it's just a really wonderful reminder of how clay has been in my life for um many many years um yeah and it just I thought it was just so funny and cute uh this is also some of like my really early work and I was like middle school a lot of like coil pots um a lot of pinch pots and as you can tell from the quality of the pictures my mom sent me these <laughs> like a week ago on her like crusty iPhone 4 <laughs> um but that's what we're working with um just some more older work this is like um probably moving into like middle school high school a little bit of high school, like exploring different colors. Um, cool. So in college, um, I was in a photography program held uh, at the Scarborough Native Child and Family Services, where I was like volunteering and participating in a lot of the youth programming. Um, so in this time, I did a lot of digital photography, and it was mostly um, landscape photography and also some wildlife life photography sorry um and then after this program we had um everyone who was in it all the young people were asked to choose five of their images to display um at the center so this one yeah so um I have been into photography since high school I got into film photography a little bit over a year ago um but also I really just enjoy taking iPhone pictures. I think that it's just like such a wonderful thing that we have at our disposal and at our fingertips. I think um, we have the ability to take really beautiful pictures with our phones and it's so special um, 
that it is so accessible to so many of us. Um, so these are some pictures I've taken just from my phone. And this is like a little nerdy moment because <laughs> I really love like iPhone photography. Uh, in 2015, the iPhone surpassed DSLR cameras produced by legacy brands like Nikon and Canon um, as the camera we used most among 120 million photographers who like share pictures on Flickr, which I thought is really cool. And um, the Pew Research Center surveyed uh, smartphone users um, and found that 92% said uh, that their camera app was the most used feature um, on their phone. Um, more than anything else. Um, uh, and I actually watched this movie called Tangerine in 2015. And I found like a lot of inspiration in that. Um, it was completely shot on an iPhone 5S. Um, and it's just like such a beautiful story. Um, and the narrative and the photography in it is just like gorgeous. Um, and I think that it's, it was just really cool to figure out that that was like shot all on a few iPhones um so yeah I really enjoy um being able to take pictures on my phone and capture like moments in my daily life of uh, taking pictures of like my family and my friends of like food and farming which brings me joy um like landscape and residential um pictures and also just like things that make me laugh um yeah um uh, taking pictures I think is also something that I hold really close and dear to me um because I've struggled with some memory issues uh due to chronic pain and fibromyalgia which causes me brain fog so like taking like silly and beautiful pictures um kind of like breaks some of that frustration that I feel uh about creating or like holding on to memories. These are some pictures I took in Colombia um, in this small town called Raquira, which is like the pottery capital of Colombia. Um, I felt really, really inspired here. Uh, I went a few months ago this year um, and I was just like, was really into all the like colors and just how vibrant the community is. Um, this was <laughs> a gigantic warehouse full of a bunch of ceramics and this guy was doing a demo and I was there with my whole family and my aunt was like came running up to me and she's like you have to come um and she uh like this guy was doing a demo typically for like kids and like families and so um she was like my aunt like my my niece loves ceramics so much like uh she should do it and so he was like oh okay come you should get up here and like throw something on the wheel and I think that he didn't really like think that I would do it because often um it's like kids or like random people <laughs> and so like my whole family and him were all like oh like you actually know what you're doing uh, <laughs> it's like a really funny little moment um but yeah well these are more pictures of um Columbia these are a few projects that I have helped out with um in Chicago um some in a park uh in a nonprofit and at a public school um i really enjoy like large scale um mural projects uh this one is one that i uh organized with my sister um at a nonprofit in my community um and it was basically uh, designed by a bunch of kids at the after school program. Um, and so they painted it after we like compiled all of their designs into like one big design. Um, and it was really special to be able to like collaborate with my sister on that. Cool. So back to ceramics. <laughs> um, so this is a few more pieces, like, again, starting from high school and into college. Um, I really have like appreciated being able to see like how um, uh, I've grown in ceramics and also just how, what I uh, have learned that I enjoy and what I don't enjoy um, and the way that I've started to explore color um, 
in different forms. I really enjoy faces. Um, this is a pour over. I have another silly story about this pour over. Um, I was on the phone with my mom and she was like, I found this like beautiful black and white thing that you made. And so I put it as a centerpiece <laughs> for this dinner <laughs> um, that we had last weekend. She was like, I don't know what it is. And she like sent me a picture of it. And I was like, oh, that's a pour over. <laughs> um, but it was very sweet. Uh, yeah. Uh, this is just some more stuff that I've made more recently in like the past like year or two. Um, this was a jewelry tray with little like octopus tentacles. Um, I've been really into um, wall pieces. So things that you can hang on your wall, little like half vases for buds or for flowers. Um, on the left is like some rudimentary like hook imagining. And then on over there is a picture of a bunch of coat hooks I made for alchemy. Um, just because I kept hearing everyone talking about how there were no hooks. And so I was like, I'm just going to fix this problem. <laughs> um, and it was just a really, really um, fun little project. Um, yeah, I really enjoyed uh, making like functional pieces that are different shapes. Cool. So I also really like making ashtrays. This is one that I really love that I made. Um, it's like a dirty napkin. <laughs> um, this is a different one. This one I made at Alchemy. Um, this is just so some more um, pieces. I have been really into exploring different like forms that I can throw on the wheel. Um, and I really enjoy the process of throwing um, donuts. I think it's like very fun. Um, this is a bowl. I really love how the glaze turned out with this. It's very vibrant, um, I think uh for a very long time for most of um my ceramics life uh up until probably about a year or two ago I was very into like neutral and warm or neutral and like earthy tones and like black and white but I've recently um been really into exploring more bright vibrant colors um I really really dislike mugs for no particular reason I just it like making them doesn't bring me joy but I really love how these two turned out they were um a commission set of espresso cups for two of my very dear friends um and I really like um the glaze and how they turned out um so also in the past year uh I've been exploring kind of just making um, little figurines. Um, these are kind of a prototype practice for making some mushrooms that were also incense cone holders. Um, and I was really unsuccessful in putting the video, this is like a still from a video, but um, it's a uh, incense cone holder and the incense smoke comes out of the mouth of the mushroom. Um, these are some more that I made this past year that make me very happy. <laughs> they each have their own little holder and they're like a little donut shape. And so I hand painted all of these with um, under glaze. Um, I really enjoy how like expressive and different they each are. Um, and I also gave them all different names. <laughs> um. Okay, so yeah, earlier this year, I also took a Nerikomi workshop, um, which is um, first created in Japan. Uh, so it involves <laughs> stacking and cutting different colors of clay to form different patterns. Um, and then once you have a pattern, you can form it into um, 
whatever you would like, or you can even throw it on the wheel. So these are some matching trinket bowls I made. Um, I really love how these turn out. Uh, this is uh, just another bowl I made here. Can you explain the process of mirror filming? Yeah. Um, so uh, the way that I have been taught it is um, you can use different clay bodies, but also you can use um, specifically, I like to use white clay um, and add what is called a mason stain, um, which is basically a powdered pigment. Um, and adding it to white clay, you can create basically any color of the clay that you would like. Um, and so that's how um, these colors were created. So uh, the darker clay is just a dark uh, brown clay body. And the white is just a white clay body, like a porcelain. Um, and then the orange and the yellow were both created by adding a colored mason stain to uh, white clay. Um, and so for this specific one, for, for example, I, um, stacked, uh, all of those different colors of clay in a way to make one flower, um, cane, which is, it's kind of like, um, when you have a cookie dough that has a, like, certain design set throughout, and then you can, like, cut from it, um, so you can create a certain design like that with clay and that block of design is called a cane and then you can cut from it. Um, and that's how I made this one is by making one flower and then cutting various pieces from it and then mushing them together kind of for lack of a better word. <laughs> um, but yeah, so these are all, um, these three are a white clay body and a black clay body. So these are not stained with any mason stain. And then this one is a mix of a white, a black, red clay body, and then a um, white uh, clay that I stained with a blue mason stain. Um, yeah, and then there's like a process. This is like before it was fired. Um, I really like how the colors change throughout both firings. Like before, once it's drying, it's like very light blue. And then at the end, it becomes like this darker color. Um, it's an interesting, interesting to see how that changes for me. This is another plate. Um, this is a big vase that I made. Um, and it's over there. Actually, I also brought it to show. Um, uh, it is made um, by inlaying various designs into um, white clay. And then I painted uh, different underglaze designs onto it. Um, and I also glazed the inside a specific way. These are more near Comey. Like this. Cool. It's another piece. Um, cool. So this year after I took that workshop, um, I also got really excited about making jewelry, um, because I got to use every scrap of these designs that I was making and all of the um patterns um especially when I was making like larger pieces or larger platters um I would have smaller bits left behind um and they're still really beautiful but they're just too small to make anything that's like functional um and so I got uh into making a lot of jewelry so these are um vaguely half butterfly uh shaped um I really like how these turned out um yeah so I jewelry to me has always been um 
a way that I have expressed myself. Uh, my mother always wore a lot of jewelry. And so to me, it, it feels like a very like personal form of self-expression and also of like my culture and my heritage. Um, I had my nameplate gifted to me when I was 18 and I watched my sister get hers. And so jewelry has always been a way that I've seen um, women in my family like present themselves in a way. Um, there's more jewelry that I've made. That's my sister, actually. She's wearing some of my jewelry. Yeah, so all of these are um, are from the Narakomi um, scraps. Yeah, I really enjoy the way that making jewelry also allows for me to really use every little bit and piece of something that I make um I think clay and like ceramics in general is a very recyclable medium um and that feels really good to me um but yeah I most of my jewelry and my earrings are really big um and I really enjoy that uh I think that I like the variants of like textures with the metals and sometimes the glass beads. Some of them are glazed, some of them are not. Um, I think like big jewelry to me makes me feel very confident and it makes me feel very connected to who I am. Um, and that is just what I would want anyone who's wearing my jewelry to feel. I'm actually wearing mine today. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, so also right before I came to Alchemy, um, kind of along the same lines of those mushrooms I made, I was exploring a little bit larger sculptural pieces. Um, this is another not great picture, but it's a still from a video from when I was epoxying um, together this large piece that I made. Um, and it's just a big lollipop. I grew up eating these lollipops. They're like these, Colum it's basically a blow pop, but it's like a Colombian blow pop. Um, yeah, I had a lot of fun making this. Um, it just brought me joy. Uh, and it makes me feel like I have um, a lot of connections to food and I feel very strongly about food um and I feel very inspired to like keep making large scale uh foods food items that I grew up eating particularly like little like snacks and Colombian treats um but yeah I, I loved making this lollipop and it was um really cool it's like two feet big um so it's very large it's uh probably the biggest, the first biggest sculptural piece that I made. So this is a little bit of the process. I hand, I threw um, two different bowls and then I um, joined them. And then I created that like outside uh, layer uh, to kind of make it look more like the lollipop. And then I actually extruded the handle. Um, yeah. cool this is um, part of a series that I made um, here at Alchemy so this is an urn this series feels very connected to um, my heritage and feels very inspired by my time in Colombia this year Um, yeah, making these was really special, uh, painting the flowers, um, 
on the plates and on the vases and on these little um, wall vases. It was very meditative um, and like connective for me. Um, once again, I really love making like wall hanging vases and that is just like the most recent like pair that I've made. Cool. This is um a series of jelly plate mono prints that I made <laughs> here. Um they make me laugh. <laughs> really it's like quite simple. Like I just really enjoyed making these. Um and they are all collaged from a series of um used comic books that I got at the used bookstore um in town. Um with then they were transferred and collaged with acrylic paint and then um I drew over a lot of them um so just took a picture of a few of them and I had a lot of fun like making little titles for all of these they just make me laugh um I think a lot of my work recently has just been um inspired by things that like bring me joy and like make me chuckle uh yeah I also really like the texture that um, I've got from a lot of these just from using different papers or, you know, the one on the right. Um, I also use bubble wrap to create like the, the top texture. Uh, the jelly plates are really cool. Um, I don't really quite understand the science behind them, but they're really cool. Yeah, they're super magical. Yeah, the process of the jelly plates are pretty cool. Um, you can transfer laser printed images onto them um, with paint because the laser printed image repels any paint and the paper around it picks up the paint. So any image is transferred on to the plate. Um, that's like the basic idea of how it works. But um, do you have to build up layers of ink for the different? Mm -hmm. Yeah, for the every different color is a different um is a different layer. Uh, so that these are all mono prints. Uh, you can only get one print from each piece of um printed uh paper that you use. But yeah. Oh, and these are two little prints that I made while I was here too, just for fun. Um, I did a little bit of um, yeah, printmaking. Um, the shrimp are linoleum block. It's a little known linoleum block stamp, and then um, the chicken is a screen print. Um, these are also all pictures I took um, on the island. They're all uh, film photos that I took and I developed here in the dark room um, with my good friend Malcolm. Um, I haven't been able to actually print these out. Uh, I actually um, made these pictures with an app I got on my phone. Then I like scanned the negative and it inverted the, the negative into a photograph. So they're not like the best quality pictures but um I thought it was kind of cool that I was able to do that um it was really crazy it's not not bad quality for for what it is but uh cool yeah and this is um a sculptural piece I made also at alchemy 
Um, this is my largest sculptural piece, I would say, to date, and also the first human figure I've ever made. Um, I really enjoyed the process of making this. So I kind of, um, while making her, I had a little bit of mental block because I wasn't sure how I wanted to complete her um, and her head. I didn't want it to be too realistic um, or like too cartoony. Um, and it was just, you know, kind of uncharted territory because I'd never made a human figure before. Um, but I really enjoy like how she came out and how the glaze looks on her body. And I used um, some of my Narakomi um, patterns for her eyes and her hair. Uh, and I really like how it turned out. Yeah, I was making her head in front of her body. Um, I was building them separately. Um, and I really liked how it looked and I got feedback that other people said it looked cool that way. And um, I don't know, it kind of spoke to me the way that her head was in front of her body. Mm, it's very reminiscent to me of how sometimes I feel very disembodied or like maybe how sometimes I feel like I'm just watching myself from above or from below living my life um and so I've just kind of felt connected to how it just looked with her head in front of her body um but this is some of the process pictures this picture of her head before adding hair or eyes <laughs> makes me laugh um kind of funny yep so that's it yeah. <laughs> cool. we have just like a couple minutes for questions just like a couple short questions if you may have some Yes. How did you make the donut base? The donut base? Oh, um, I threw it on the wheel. Uh, basically, you make a hole in the middle, and then you make two. You have to make like a a, a rounded, two walled vessel with a hole in the middle, and then you close it up so that you trap the air inside so that it keeps that shape. And then you um, cut it off and you trim it um, and you like create a hole so it doesn't explode in the kiln. But yeah, it was on the wheel. It's like a really fun process. I really enjoy um, throwing donuts. It's fun. Yeah. Yeah. Do you think you're going to continue with like figurative work after this? Is this like your first foray in the figurative work? And Yes. Yeah. It's cool. yeah yeah it is it's my first so like the lollipop before I came here and then also this um uh piece was my first like sculptural pieces um and this is my first figurative piece I really enjoyed it I really enjoyed making the head especially um and tweaking little things about her face that really changed her expression um and I, I would like to make more, I would like to make maybe like a series of heads like this um, that also incorporate the Narakomi technique because I just really like the effect that it gives it. Um, and I like how like graphic and bold those colors and lines can be. Um, yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, thanks for you. <laughs> <laughs>
Thank you, Camila. <laughs> um, now introducing Charlie Bloat, our second speaker. And I'm actually just going to also, while I'm doing this, just go right in here. <laughs> and then I'm going to do the thing. Wait, how do you do this? Oh, yeah, slideshow. Ha, ha, ha. Every time I do this, I learn it again. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. Hi, everyone. I'm Charlie Blady. Um, oh, I'm sorry. No, that's kidding. okay. <laughs> that's totally okay. It I doesn't look like how it is pronounced Blady. at all. Yeah, it's kind of funny. That was so <laughs> no worries. Um, I just graduated from Kansas State with my Bachelor in Fine Arts and a concentration in printmaking. I'm from Grays Lake, Illinois, which is about 40 minutes north of Chicago. And I'm really excited to share some of my work with you all today. Wait, oh yeah, okay. <laughs> Okay, so some of my first work um, in printmaking was this series that I made um, of linoleum block prints related to my experience during COVID. So I tried creating this wordless novel um, through board games, and I specifically chose board games because I felt that um, a lot of people during the pandemic were cooped up inside and chose to play board games a lot, to find something to do with their time. So I really resonated with that. Um, the first board game I chose was Life, which is like pretty obvious how life relates to this. <laughs> um, so kind of like us taking a turn and like the start of COVID and like filing for unemployment and stimulus checks and all these things we had to go through and overcome. And I put little illustrations within the print of us um, doing things that kind of got normalized during the pandemic, like life being fully online or us having to Lysol our groceries. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Um, and the next one I did was Monopoly. Um, and I put this like toilet paper emblem in all of these prints. Um, so everyone was like, ah, toilet paper. <laughs> it's just like, oh my gosh, so crazy. Um, and I feel like Monopoly itself kind of uh, captures, you know, money in the infrastructure and the housing market. And the housing market was a huge part of my experience during COVID because my mom is a realtor. And so she was like an essential worker and all these people were trying to like buy houses because rates were so low during the pandemic. And it was just really kind of crazy. Um, and the next one I chose to do was shoots and ladders and I feel like this one was very interesting because the board game itself kind of follows the consequences of the choices that you make um so you can see like someone in the top corner is not wearing their mask properly so they go down the slide back eight steps and they're sick <laughs> um, or someone that chooses to social distance and they're a winner and um, kind of this, yeah, like just a position, just a position of, you know, the consequences and actions to like stay safe during these times. And then the last one I did was Operation. Um, this one was my favorite. Um, and it felt like very essential because we had all these people and healthcare workers that were trying to revolutionize healthcare during the pandemic and how they all got really burned out and we were kind of trying to find these band-aid solutions to keep everyone safe but also find more workers and it was just really um, interesting and hard. So after that I um, learned how to do reduction wood blocks which essentially you have a block and then you carve part of it away and you stamp it and then you on that same block carve more of it away and then stamp it. So all of these layers on this print are from one block. It's a seven layer reduction wood block that's two foot by three foot. My first and only reduction <laughs> wood block. Uh, here's a picture of the process. I like got really crazy into it. 
and I like sharpied every single color as a different layer on this block and um yeah I like went super overboard uh but one of these photos is like after four layers what the print looked like um so kind of interesting seeing how the layers build up um so after I got really into woodblock printing I ended up moving to Alaska for a summer to do um be a kayaking guide in the Kenai Fjords National Park um I guess it's not really related to this print, but while I was there, I spent a lot of time listening to podcasts, and one of the podcasts I was listening to all the time was called Stuff You Should Know Podcast, um, and they had an episode on the history of superstitions, um, and so this block print is based off of the story I heard in this podcast about the lucky rabbit's foot. And so they say that the rabbit's foot is lucky because if you see a rabbit in a graveyard during a full moon, that it's actually a witch that has transformed into a rabbit under all of these specific conditions. <laughs> and that if you shoot the rabbit with a silver bullet, that all of the witch's magic, and you cut off the back left foot, that all of the witch's magic will... Um, <laughs> go into this foot and then the person that has this rabbit's foot actually um is like lucky because they have all the lucky magic with them from this witch that's been harbored in this rabbit's foot <laughs> well that's such a crazy story i'm gonna make a print about it <laughs> so i thought that was like really cool um and so here are some of my like process pictures um, and carving my block and kind of the details that went into that. Um, block printing is like really interesting because everything you carve when you print it is reversed. So this is the um, print all inked up and on the press bed and then what it looks like again, um, the reversed image. And so after that, uh, there was another superstition within the podcast, and it was like, why people throw salt over their shoulder. And um, during the Last Supper, um, the devil was sneaking up on Jesus, and it knocked <laughs> over the salt. And so then he knew that the devil was behind him. So he threw salt behind his shoulder to blind the devil. So whenever people are like, like spill salt they feel like a negative energy her presence has like come upon them and they like throw salt to get rid of it which I thought was like really interesting also and so I made a print about it um it's kind of interesting like a lot of these different superstitions are based off of one culture or one origin and a lot of different cultures have different origin stories for these superstitions so it's kind of fun that this is just one version of these stories um and so after that I learned how to do etching which is my favorite thing on the whole planet <laughs> Um, this is my first etching I ever did, and it was of a Venus flytrap eating fast food, <laughs> and it was surrounded by all of its, like, natural foods, like flies that it should be eating, but it's not. I chose this fast food instead. I just thought that was really funny. There's not a deeper meaning. <laughs> um, for those of you that don't know what etching is, essentially, you have a piece of copper and then you kind of put this almost like paint, it's called hard ground on the copper. And then you draw into the hard ground and what you draw, um, you then put in acid and it etches those lines deep into the copper. So when you put ink on the copper, that's what shows up. So this is also a picture of me pulling my plate out of our like crunchy acid bags. <laughs> so, so cool. Um, so that really got me into etching and I started making these pretty um, elaborate like color etchings. Um, this one's titled Modern Dystopia and it's kind of like my take on what the world will be 
years and years from now um and we'll all like the earth will be covered in water and we'll be living in these huts above the water and there's like this trash that's like over the ocean um so you can't even see into it and kind of like robots have taken over this is like a very elaborate story that I've created in my head <laughs> um and kind of figuring out how to layer color on top of each other within etching um so one of these the one that's pink and yellow is one plate and it's I've wiped it and then I've rolled pink ink over it and then yellow ink and then depending on how deep certain parts are etched is where the color shows up differently um so that's really interesting and then this one that has kind of like the black ink blobs on them is it is two etching plates that have been layered on top of each other um where the back plate is kind of this like yellow blue and the top plate is red so I had a really fun time with that. And then this next print, which is one of my favorites, is called The Rabbit Died. Um, last Christmas, I was hanging out with my grandma and she was like, when I found out that I was pregnant with your aunt, they told, like, I went to the doctor and they told me the rabbit died. And I was like, what does that mean? Like, <laughs> <laughs> I did not know what she meant at all, but apparently um, they used to inject your urine into a rabbit and then based off of what the rabbit's ovaries did, that's how you would know you were pregnant. So um, they would say like the rabbit died. So if the rabbit was tested with your urine and it died, you knew you were pregnant. So then I have like these, <laughs> um, yeah, kind of weird. I swear it's a real thing. So then these are like my source imagery of rabbits being injected with urine and like them being tested on. Um, and then like kind of the imagery I chose, like you have these like fetuses in this balloon. Um, kind of crazy. Okay. I have a link for you guys. I don't know if you have listened to Aerosmith at all, but... Um, they reference this in one of their songs, so I wanted to play it for you. I don't know if everyone can hear it. Is it loud enough? Just listen. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> because the rabbit don't die wow. yeah anyways it's in pop culture it's real <laughs> so i don't know if I get, oh i don't want to play it again <laughs> um, he was like i'm not being baby trapped because the rabbit died um yeah i don't know i thought that was really funny so i included it but yeah so um here are the images again now that you've like learned all that information <laughs> It's kind of crazy, but I was like, thanks for educating me, Grandma. Um, yeah, and I gave her this print when I graduated college, and she was really excited. And yeah, so that was a really sweet moment between us. I was like, yeah, no. uh, And so after that, I got really, um, as a young artist, into like self-reflection and kind of my personal journey. Um, so this uh, etching plate is titled Headache. Um, one of my friends gave me this book called The Midnight Library. And the story behind The Midnight Library was this girl who um, was really unhappy with her life and decided to try and kill herself. And then she kind of got sent to this purgatory that was this library and all of the books in the library were um, a story about her life if she had made a different choice, like what her life would be like and how it would be different. Um, and then she'd live in that uh, life until she was unhappy. And then she was sent back to the library to kind of go over some of her other choices and like what she feels like could have made her happier. And I really, really like, was into this book and I thought it was like so special. Um, so I uh, took this 
<laughs> this is kind of this reference photo of myself um and this like really deep thought uh but I then I use that and put a library like in my head and kind of like your inner dialogue and kind of the little goblin in your head that's like forcing you to think about all these anxieties and like pressures of the world and your life choices and these kind of like throwing these books to the forefront of your mind. Um, so that was like my inspiration for this piece. In the library, Midnight Library, great read. If you haven't read it, I highly recommend. Um, and so that after that, I spent a summer studying abroad in Florence, um, Italy, and we had one weekend where we went to Venice and I was really um, kind of starstruck by all like the masquerade masks that they had and kind of the different masks that like we put on for different people. So I have this one mask that looks like the most human-like is like a distorted version of my face and then I'm like holding this other mask that's holding a mask that's holding a mask and like kind of the different masks we're putting on for people and ourself um and this one was really cool because this plate went through like a lot of different states so I originally used soft ground which is um the top version of it and then after I printed it I was like this that's not done so then I put lithocran on it and then after I etched it more in the acid um with the lithocran on it uh then when it was wiped up it looked like that bottom one and then I uh printed that and we have our different state and then it ended up looking like this so pretty cool um the different states of the plates so then I got really into like the history of fashion and self-image and beauty standards. Um, and so I spent all this time researching um, Mad Hatter's and Mad Hatter's disease. Um, so I don't know if you guys have all probably watched Alice in Wonderland and how there's like the crazy Mad Hatter. Well, um, the history behind that is essentially like these hatters were using mercury to mat down their hats, but the mercury gave them severe mercury poisoning, which caused them to have these like crazy hallucinations. So that's why when people think of like mad hatters and like being crazy, it's because they were all just like tripping really hard because they were getting poisoned by mercury, um, which is pretty crazy. Yeah, and so... Um, at the same time, people that had syphilis, they were getting treated with mercury pills, which we know that's not the cure now, but they thought that then. So um, they were also had this like joint experience of kind of hallucinating from mercury poisoning. So I took these um, heads that had syphilis and I carved them into wood block. Um, yeah sorry okay uh, and then I hand marbled um lots of different paper um and kind of tried to capture the energy like the crazy energy of like hallucinating in these like colors and textures uh from paper marbling um and so this is all the heads together on a wall and kind of trying to capture the energy of all of that together. And I feel that um, when the work is like presented as a unit, it really captures the energy of like hallucinating and like this disease that they were all facing um, a lot more than kind of if they were looked at separately. Mm -hmm. It's kind of cool that they create that all together. Um, so after that, I made this uh, screen print, acrylic paint, woodblock, mixed media um, piece of art about um, tapeworm diets. <laughs> In the 1950s, they uh, advertised tapeworm diets as like an actual thing for people, like a lot of housewives to like that we're buying all the groceries to like take 
so here's the original ad and it's like so crazy because you look at this ad and it says like no ill effect tapeworms easy to swallow <laughs> like <laughs> um it's like so crazy that no one got in trouble for this <laughs> um so I took this ad and I reappropriated the um images from that and I um, found all of the different products on the ad and kind of used these as references to paint um, accurate colors of all of these different um, foods of the time period and the woman. And I placed this like these gigantic tapeworms eating her from the outside in even though they were eating her from the inside out. And, um, and then I, uh, oop, too far. And then I printed a large wood block on top of that to create this like graphic nature um, of the worms and all the food and stuff. Um, and I like carved this block before I, um made the screens for it and I like did not measure how big the screens were so I instead of having two screens I had like eight screens because I had to like break them up into all these small screens and then try and register it it was a whole big mess I made it really hard for, <laughs> for no reason <laughs> but that's okay um and then this one is the biggest piece of work that I've made um it's five foot seven it's titled beauty or ashes um in the Victorian era um, a lot of women would wear these really large Victorian dresses and um, they obviously had like many layers of fabric uh, and so it made it really, really hard to get out of these dresses and they were made of really flammable material like cotton. Um, so if these women were found um, found themselves around like a flame or a candle and their dress caught fire they would essentially end up burning to death and so this piece is based off of that experience um, and a lot of these women um, also wore like green dresses because green was very royal and like um, a color people really wanted to be wearing and so the green fabric also the dye um, had arsenic in it so if they didn't burned to death a lot of them got arsenic poisoning and that was like a whole crazy thing um so hard to try and be beautiful <laughs> uh so then here are some like images like of um kind of historical illustrations of these like women wearing green dresses and like they're on smoke they're like on fire and there's smoke behind them but it doesn't matter because they like look pretty um just like so crazy and so my process during making this work I did a lot of screen printing uh mono prints so I took screen screens and then I used watercolor crayon and I drew with watercolor crayon onto the screen and then I flooded the screen with transparent base um and it transferred the uh watercolor crayons onto paper so this is kind of like a me drawing the pattern and then what the pattern looks like printed um and then I bought a dress pattern um for like a historical dress and I used it to um hand sew all of these paper all of this paper together to create this life-size dress and then I um used an exacto knife to hand cut all of the um black paper details on it and so here's me holding it up <laughs> I bought a mannequin off Amazon to display it on and I had to essentially rebuild it after I built it because uh paper is not as flexible as fabric <laughs> which I realized after I got the mannequin and I was like this won't go on uh, <laughs> uh and so then I um covered the mannequin in a white paint and modeling paste um to kind of create this texture of it looking burnt and then I used powdered charcoal and I like covered it in powdered charcoal um and used spray fixative to keep it to stay 
And so here are these some detailed shots of um, the dress and my mannequin that is burnt. And I like ripped the bottom and ripped holes in the dress to um, kind of create the sense that like holes have been burned in it and the edges have been burnt. And they're like the feet in the back of the dress. Um, yeah. And then here's an image of all of this work about like beauty and the history of like these fashion trends um, and how they kind of interact together in a space. Uh, I found it really fun because I like um, used all the scrap paper that I tore off the dress and like sprinkled it around the gallery and I showed the name of the piece like on one of these like burnt scrap fabric or paper not fabric but um. uh and then right before I graduated college I made this piece of an elephant coming out of a gramophone um this one doesn't have a deeper meaning like all the other ones <laughs> I just thought it was cool and I drew a picture of it in high school and then when I got to last this last year I was like whoa I could make that so much better as an etching so I did and um Here's a the plate next to the the etching, which is pretty cool. Um, and then I started a series of prints before I graduated as well, and they're all these um amusement park rides that um are body parts. So it's like a eyeball is like the swinging chair ride, and the veins are the little rides, and like the giant drop, and people are riding in their toenails and but I never got to finish these plates and I was really sad about that. So um, when I got here to Alchemy, I used that as inspiration to create this larger series of blocks um, based off of like roller coaster rides being like a monster. And you don't know if it's like trying to eat the people riding the roller coaster or it's going to be gross and spit it out and <laughs> I don't know it's just kind of funny and um <laughs> it's been really like cool being here on the island and getting to create this body of work outside of an academic environment because it's been my first experience doing that um and I feel really proud of these roller coaster prints and the time that I've gotten to make them here so yeah that's it do we have any questions? Oh, yeah. yeah, we have time for just sorry. That's fine. We have time. Does anyone have any questions? A couple of questions. I have one. Okay. Uh, it's not really an artist question because I'm not really an artist. Okay. Uh, it's, you have a fascination with toxicology. No. About it. I don't. I, I, it's really cool. <laughs> I, I, I want to tell you why. It's more of a statement. Mm -hmm. You have like three or four different kinds of chemicals. You had arsenic, tape worms, mercury. Yeah. Right? And so this is an old uh, adage of the dose makes the poison. It's by Paracelsus. It's really old. Mm. So the, the, that is, was the dawn of what we perceive as toxicology in the water. Cool. How do you distinguish between self and not self? And I wonder what about that? Like, do you think about physiology at all before you think about, well, hey, the kind of crazy ass metal interacts with the skin in this way, and then the heart pops out? Or how do you think about that? Um, <laughs> I definitely don't think about those things, <laughs> but maybe I will now. <laughs> yeah, it's cool. That's an interesting thought. Did you study medieval history while you're in college or art? No, just yeah. printmaking, basically. I had the unique experience of um, doing college during the pandemic. So, like, basically the only class I went to in person for was my printmaking class. Gotcha. So I think that's part of the reason why I got so into it as well was because it was, like, in-person experience and something I really connected with and... Yeah, it seems yeah. like there's a lot of like you know, kind of medieval oddities of sorts that like you only really get by really doing it. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I've done like extensive <laughs> internet research on all of these things. Um, 
But I don't know. I wouldn't say that's like a real explanation on stuff. There is a podcast you said you listen to. Yeah. What's that? The Stuff You Should Know podcast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Katie. Okay, I don't know if it's going to end in a question, but. Okay. Um, you seem like really interested in the macabre and like the pizzas. Yeah. And it's like, like casual. <laughs> yeah. 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 I feel like a lot of people that I've met who are into that. It's like a big part of their identity, or and it like shows up in how they look. Mm-hmm. Like, I guess maybe my question is like, are you really into the macabre? <laughs> <laughs> or kind of like, oh, that's funny. The macabre curious. Yeah. Yeah, I feel like I'm more the second one where I just like find it really interesting, and then I'm like, wow, maybe other people will find this interesting, and then. I get really into like the history and stories behind some of my prints and like sometimes I feel like that's more meaningful for me like the stories behind them than like the physical body of work. Like you don't have a yarn full of alligators in your mouth hot. No I don't. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What are some of your favorite artists? Mm, that's hard. Um there's a printmaker that I really like. Her name is Amanda Outclat, I think is the last name, but she's this really cool printmaker that does these like etchings of animals and then she like cuts out the um the animal out of copper and then prints just that and then does these like fanciful illustrations around them. And I think that's really cool. And I was really inspired by like Goya and his weird like you know like demon art <laughs> that's yeah 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 totally or um have you guys ever heard of the artist madrian uh he's like pretty famous with an art history where he like breaks down all of these uh like art pieces into like red yellow blue squares and then it's like this deconstructed cow yeah that's like a red, yellow, blue square. And then it's like, where did you get that? I don't know. I think that's really interesting too. Yeah. Yeah. So. Oh, that's really okay. Um, how are people feeling? Uh, should we just keep going? Feel free to like use the restroom or whatever you need to do yeah. but let's just keep going I think this is this is a really good flow and um next up we have Cosette Ellis who is a previous resident for Alchemy Art Center and is now a permanent resident who is our outreach coordinator so is there a way for me to be able to see the notes on the slide? No, I'm so sorry. Uh -oh. that's, yeah, that's like this dumb thing. Can I pull them up on your computer? Okay, yeah, let's do like a quick, maybe let's we'll do, do a like quick pause. Three minutes. Let's do a quick, tiny pause. I'm going to pause the recording. Yeah. yeah. Oh, I'm sorry. How do you get this to be big? I don't know. <laughs> Wait, why is it no this is a secret you guys can't see this yet yeah. <laughs> wait where did the Man control F go no. No. i don't know no okay i'm gonna get started he 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 Food. Well, I'm the last young artist for today. Um, my name is Cosette. I'm <laughs> I'm actually not. I think I'm the youngest artist. Just not I'm younger. You're younger? <laughs> okay, I'll take it. Um, <laughs> woo, usually I am the youngest. So yeah, my name is Cosette Ellis. Um, I am a visual artist and illustrator. Um, been drawing since I was a little kid. Uh, last year I graduated from UC Davis in California with a bachelor's in design. Um, then I moved to San Juan in August to do a internship, ended up staying two months longer than I was supposed to. 
and then I came back in March and now I live here. <laughs> um, and what I do here is coordinate the outreach program for Alchemy, um, which was my first summer doing and I really enjoyed it. Um, and this is my artist talk. Okay, so I feel like my my presentation will be very timeline oriented because I feel like it's all really relevant um, and also a little bit embarrassing, but you know, that we're just gonna roll with it. Um, Oops, sorry, I just opened something else on this computer. So again, I've been drawing since I can remember. Um, I remember from like the ages of five to 10, we lived in the middle of the Redwood Forest and I would wake up at like 4 a.m. and turn on all of the lights in the house and then just like go into my room and draw until it was time for the school bus. And I just would like do that super consistently. Um, so art was just like always natural. It was always like what I did to like center and ground myself. And my parents were always like pretty supportive of it. <laughs> Here's a few drawings. Um, so <laughs> my my first inspiration was actually the like Archie comic books. Um, I remember trying to like mimic the illustration style and just like spending what I perceived as like an extreme amount of money on them and like buying them from like Walmart or something um, and just like stocking them up. Um, so I started out by copying, which I think a lot of artists do specifically if you like to draw. Um, and then eventually I moved on to drawing my own characters. I had like a very important phase of like punk rock looking girls with their like hands behind their uh, back and then like fairies and mermaids, which you can see this is like a, Christmas card well my mom made it into a Christmas card I'm the one in the center my little sister is the one <laughs> that's floating that's my dad and that's my mom um classic best thing I've ever done uh mermaid drawing mostly just in colored pencil um again baseline of my art practice it was just to anchor myself um something quiet and like engaging that was mine only um and I feel like I, I was able to really stay in a very safe little world for like a lot of my youth, but then like things got pretty turbulent in my life. And I feel like I was really glad to have an art practice because I was just like creating my own safety, like my entire childhood. Not that I was unsafe, but just like a safer place. Um, okay, this is why it's embarrassing, but I think you guys should see this. So um, I started taking art more seriously when I was in junior high. Um, I was exposed to a variety of different illustrators through the internet um, and also like going to comic book stores and having more independence. Um, I kind of felt like witnessing like from afar all of these like I don't know glamorous people making art kind of made my world explode and I was like oh like this is actually like something I could maybe do in my future um so this was yeah this was like a supremely nerdy time I mostly drew fan art so again I was like mimicking um but that helped me really like cultivate my own style and also figure out how to draw bodies which I feel like is super super relevant to my work like since then um mostly just working in ink. Um, and I drew a lot. Like, I, I feel like up until maybe mid high school, I was drawing like every day. Like it just was like, it was all that I wanted to do. And I would like get in trouble for it at school. Um, okay. So yeah, actually, I'm not going to tell you what the, who the characters are. That's so stupid. I don't want to do that. <laughs> just like fan art it's really silly okay um this is just like more of my work from like end of junior high beginning of high school um this is when I was like kind of starting to experiment with like drawing things that weren't just like copying shows I was obsessed with um a lot of like saturated color because I was using like prismacolor markers um and then some like early motifs so like this women with animal skulls um form and posing so like trying to figure out how to like make bodies more dynamic um and working with like light and shadow through um kind of like non-conventional color choices so um yeah you know like using all of the different variations of like yellow and orange and red and then the blue background and so on and so forth lots of women <laughs> haven't changed okay so some of my inspirations are I will tell them to you um 
So kind of going from left to right, um, left is a comic book called Tank Girl, which is a cult comic illustrated by Jamie Hewlett, who is this like really awesome British illustrator. He also created all of the characters and illustration for the band Gorillaz. Um, he is just like scrappy as hell and like just has like a more like traditional punk comic book style. And I feel like I really just like enjoy I just really enjoy his illustrations and his work has like changed a lot through time. And I feel like he um, works a lot more with kind of like color and tone now than he used to. I feel like his old comic books are like, or his old work is much more like black is the shadow and like the line work is really important. So love him. Um, After him is a panel from the uh, incredible manga Akira, which um, was illustrated by Katsuhiro Otomo. Um, He's just like a master. He's just like mind-blowingly dynamic imagery. Um, really, really crazy line work. His anatomy is really incredible. His perspective is insane. He does like these in in this world, there's like the city of Neo Tokyo, and there's like a lot of explosions that happen. And his like illustration of exploding cityscapes is really crazy. Haven't tried to emulate that, but I'm inspired by them. Um, next is Craig Thompson, who um is the illustrator of the graphic novels blankets and habibi um his work is just like incredibly personal and he really relies on like pattern and motif in a way that i find super inspiring um and his figure drawing is also incredible and then last is um from the movie nausicaa of the valley of the wind which is a film by studio ghibli so Hayao miyazaki is like the main illustrator for that um and it's just like i don't know the the storylines overall for studio ghibli are just super dynamic and nostalgic they're like emotion forward and really like kind and like soft and beautiful um but I really like this particular film because it's one of his like oldest and it's also just like really scrappy and insane it's like a like post-apocalyptic society and there's like this toxic jungle full of these huge insects and it's just like really really cool um and yeah so I feel like all of these artists either do both or are either or of like both raw and um really gentle and I feel like that interplay is something that I um kind of use a lot in my own artwork okay moving on um these are some panels from a short comic that I illustrated when I was in 11th grade um it's called wormhole it's just ink on paper um between eighth and 11th grade, I seriously considered being a comic book illustrator. Um, like all of my art education was self-directed. So I didn't really have like a good idea of like how actually time consuming and insane that like career pathway is, but I was very like drawn to it. Um, I did this at a summer program at the like Otis College of Art and Design when yeah, in 11th grade. And then I actually, my, my like art education again was really self-directed. I went to like a really like rural core public high school and my art teacher was just like floating in her own world. So like, I just like, I just got to like hang out basically. Um, but I did get to do summer programs. Another one that I did was at, um, CCA in Oakland before it shut down, which that's Maria's alma mater. So that was really cool as well. Um, I feel like this, is not necessarily like what my work looks like these days, but it's a good example of my more like graphic novel oriented work. Um, and it's also like a representation of narrative and how to like convey, um, you know, emotion and movement um, without dialogue. So um, yeah, it also like scratches an itch in my brain, just like all of the little lines in space. So yeah, you. Uh, this is, um, two, like, pictures of panels from a, like, illustrated poem that I did for my Spanish class. Um, it focuses on, like, color again, and then narrative placement of text. Um, and then I think I also really like it because it conveys turmoil, um, especially, like, the figures in the bottom corner, like, um, I don't know. I feel like I just am still really satisfied with their like facial expressions. I think it helps that they are like literally gray and look 
really upset about something but yeah it's like the poem is called oda a las cosas rotas um so it's like ode to the broken things basically um so it's sad but it was fun to do um still in high school this is the last high school slide late high school beginning to work with color and pattern um very early work with pattern beginning to utilize um, watercolor and colored pencil together, which is something that I still like to do a lot. Um, and then trying to get better at like um, anatomical accuracy. And um, I don't know, I feel like in high school, I was like very into like maybe the more like simplistic ideology of the like body positivity movement with all of my little like teenage insecurities. So I feel like that was important to me with the work that I was doing. Um, and I also just generally was like drawing a lot less. Like I feel like as unfortunately, as like I have gotten older, just like the constant like creation of artwork has become less of a priority because making art has become a lot less casual. Um, so it's like a give and take, but I feel like that's like important to note. <clears throat> okay. So now we're in college. Um, I, again, chose to study design at UC Davis. Um, this was a pretty significant reroute from my art practice that I had been like utilizing my entire life. Um, UC Davis's design program is really largely focused on like graphic design, UI UX, which is like tech, um, sustainable design and like branding. So most of the classes were on computers and um, I don't know. I, I feel like they were all about like learning specific design software like Adobe. And I found that really valuable, but also like really challenging and not at all rewarding. Um, or I, it was kind of rewarding, but like I didn't like love it. Um, I also had pretty like severe imposter syndrome coming from like a tiny public school. Um, and it felt like a lot of the students just have like way more experience than I did, which who knows if that's true. But I like at 18, I was like, oh. <laughs> um <laughs> so yeah but eventually I like found my place in the design department more oriented around like textiles and printmaking but a lot of the like illustration and art work that I did in college was um through involvements outside of academics so I was part I worked as like a designer and illustrator for a student-run political publication called the Davis Political Review so I would um like work with the journalists to create a um, illustration for the articles that they wrote. And then we would make like an annual publication um, that would have lots of different illustrations. So I feel like this was my first foray into like making very politically motivated artwork. And I'm really like passionate about it. I, I haven't been doing it as much lately because I've just been making work to sell mostly, but it's definitely like being an editorial illustrator is something that really interests me and I'd like to do in the future. And again, like watercolor and colored pencil was like my main, those were my main guys for this type of work. Um, okay, so again, coming kind of back to narrative, but in like a different way, um, I, again, really struggled at first in college, leaving my hometown was like pretty difficult. And I feel like I just like ached for like two years straight and like didn't know how to hold on to those feelings. Um, so a grounding practice that I kind of started with my work was both combining like prose poetry with um, illustration. And it was very often just like in the moment I would do that. So um, I still really enjoy doing this. Um, it's very personal and so it's kind of like hard to share but I found when I do share it like online people really really connect with it so yeah I don't know I just feel like it's it's relevant to the work that I'm making um and I feel like making like a zine in the future with multiple different versions of this type of poetry would be really cool um maybe like screen printed so um, okay, a little bit more work from college. Again, colored pencil, watercolor, um, just really like rooting myself into the traditional media that like I have grown up using. Um, I feel like I kind of did this as like a way of like combating my design education that told me drawing like wasn't not that not not that anyone explicitly told me this, but I just felt like because this like I perceived that this never would make me money. I like 
try, like initially moved away from illustration and then like came back to it with like a lot of vigor. Um, yeah, so birthday cards, um, more stuff for Davis Political Review. Um, and then like a big painting, big watercolor painting on the end that's like this tall that I did for a um, scholarship application. And then another like motif, the animal skulls kind of coming in. And I feel like I also just like really rely on the like the colors, yellow and blue in my work. Just like I just those are some of my favorite colors, the way they offset each other. So, yeah, I um, I don't know that this was necessary, but I feel like I identified like three main components of my work that are like pretty significant. Um, first one is color. As you have seen, I in my traditional illustration work, I just really, I feel like I go kind of insane with like layering color. Um, it's less relevant to a lot of the work that I've done at Alchemy because I've mostly been doing like screen printing and pottery and you just can't get, you could, I mean, I could if I like really was dedicated to it, but I'm not trying to get like that level of color saturation with it. Um, I, you know, color like adds emotion. It can make things more complex. Um, portraying like light and shadow and texture can add so much more body to your artwork. But I feel like color is something I utilize the most in just like my personal work. Um, I also don't understand color theory at all, but <laughs> just, you know, I'm gonna be honest. Um, okay, so I feel like this is like a very good example of color in my work. Um, this is a drawing that I did called Homecoming. Um, I did it in 2021. It's pen and colored pencil. I did this around Christmas, hence the Christmas lights. And my family was also going to be moving, hence the home. <laughs> um this is another drawing that I did that I feel like utilizes color pretty well it's called kinship um I minored in Native American studies in college and I was taking a class um called Native Women and we were um doing a unit on indigenous midwifery in the Amazon um and I just found that like really powerful um just like the like birthing techniques that they use that are like incredibly functional but not utilized by western medicine so um yeah I was able to actually make this for a class which was really cool um and then coming to the end of college getting actually into printmaking which is now like a huge part of what I do um I learned how to do mono printing screen printing and then I think it was offset lithography is the bottom one I'm actually not sure we only did that once um, but I, you know, had, I wish I had discussed, well, one of the reasons why I love the work that we do at Alchemy is because I'm like exposing children to things that I like am now trying to make a living with and didn't learn until like last year. So it feels really great to like teach kids how to screen print, um, and, you know, hope that they will have, you know, more time to develop their skill set um, in the future. Do, do, do. Uh, this is the medium that Charlie is just like a beast at, um, that I really enjoyed, but literally only did once it's, um, like copper plate etching. So I did two self portraits. They're called, um, waxing and waning. Um, the, there's like some recurring motifs in here that kind of portray emotion. So like the zigzaggy spiky shapes are for anxiety and energy. And then the swirly shapes are for like exhaustion and depression um I feel like in college um a lot of the times that I really actually had time to make traditional work was when I kind of like had backed myself into a bit of a mental corner um and so when I was actually able to make personal work for a class I usually went the like deeper like catharsis inducing route um so yeah I don't know I think that I hope that a lot of artists can relate to this, but I feel like um, art practice kind of gives difficult emotions a container outside of your body and it gives you like a way to like analyze them and process them. And that's like something that's still really huge in my work. It also makes giving an artist talk really scary. But, you know, we're all friends here. Okay, next next main component and arguably the the biggest component of my work is body bodies um i have just always drawn people 
uh, bodies are just like so interesting and dynamic um, and expressive and also like really challenging objectively challenging to draw and also very challenging to have um <laughs> i i camila and i can relate to both dealing with a decent amount of like chronic pain um i have been for the past few years and i feel like that's very much um influenced my art practice in the way that i'm like portraying bodies um a lot of the work that i've done at alchemy um, I have found the figures that I'm drawing end up looking really contorted and kind of like disturbed. But I feel like while that's not, that's like an, I, like, that's not the overarching experience of having a body. It's like a significant expression of personhood for me. So I feel like that's why my drawings look that way. Um, uh, okay. No, that's too far. Okay, so that's me bald. That's me when I was bald. <laughs> um, so this, I feel like this is like a very good representation of like bod, like the body in my work. Um, I made this for my design capstone course. It is a five foot seven, um, tapestry made of um a bunch of different like screen print. So yeah, the 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 panels are painted with fiber reactive dye which was what I mostly use in my design program so painted with fiber reactive dye then screen printed with either spiky or like gloopy motifs and then screen printed with normal black or white screen printing ink um, with drawings that I did while I had COVID two weeks before I graduated and then printed all of this in one week <laughs> so it was like kind of a psychotic experience um but yeah, I am like, I've never been more proud of a piece of work. And I don't think I've like ever, I don't know that I've ever made anything actually as big as this before too. It's like literally my height and width. Um, and the tapestry is about living with chronic pain and illness. Um, and it was a very good container for the experience. Um, I hadn't really ever tried to summarize it. I didn't know how. Um, and it all just kind of like came to a head as I was graduating and I am really proud of what I ended up making. So yeah, all of, all of the, there's like a ton of different panels and I'm going to like focus on, I'm going to show you one or two more. Um, yeah. And again, interspersing narrative and poetry, um, with the drawings. So yeah, that's me when I was bald and had COVID and that's me if I was, in this field of mustard that is by the train tracks where I went to college. Moving on. Okay. Alchemy. <laughs> um, yeah. So graduated summer last year, drove up to Washington um, and then really started having a renaissance for my art practice, which was really awesome. Um, yeah. I just like finally had time to like make again, both for myself actually just like entirely for myself basically, which was really cool. Um, living at an art center is just like the perfect way to like utilize your artistic muscles because there's just like the like underlying pressure to make and make and make and make because the studio is like right there, which mm -hmm. is wonderful. Um, I spent most of my time last year really getting deeper into printmaking. I learned how to do lino cut and did a lot more screen printing and then also did some drawing and learned how to do wheel throwing, which I love so much now, even though it's really hard. Mm -hmm. um, oh yeah, screen printing, love it when my friends wear my clothes. <laughs> That's Lenore, we were in the residency together. That's Story looking at Evan wearing oh a sweater of Story <laughs> that I made. And then that's my friend Cole being cool. <laughs> Oh. And this one, and that one, that one is from this year. Um, so this brings me to like my last, like significant thing that impacts my artistic practice, which is pattern. This is, I feel like a lot newer, but like the pattern and color thing tie in together a lot. Um, I utilize pattern a lot because I feel like it really pairs well with figures. And I also don't want to draw backgrounds. Um, so it's nice to have some type of pattern in the background to make it so that your figure isn't just like floating in space. And I feel like, yeah, just like making my brain work to create new patterns is like very interesting. I also definitely have like been inspired by previous 
resident artists at Alchemy like Maya who did yeah. incredible pattern stuff. We all were. Yeah, we all were. So here's just like two examples of my work that I feel like utilize pattern pretty well. Um, one is a oil pastel drawing I did last summer. And then one is like a screen printed bandana that I did. Um, yeah, they don't have titles, but yeah, again, motif of like skull, animal skull woman. She's eating an orange in the center. She's all like hunched down. <clears throat> um another example of like pattern body color um this was a huge oil pastel drawing that i decided to start the night before the cumulative show of my residency um and yeah and i got and i got oil pastel all over the walls of the dome and i felt really bad and then katie painted over it for me i think or maybe it was casey some I didn't I didn't do it because I was leaving to go to Seattle like a really silly little girl so anyway um yeah this was on newsprint so it kept ripping but I'm really pleased <laughs> I'm really pleased with the way it turned out it's kind. I think it's like larger than life size probably it's like six sheets of newsprint um yeah yeah that's her <laughs> um another example of pattern and body um this one is entitled too bright it is my only ever reduction print which was the process that charlie was talking about earlier which is like carving a way to block and then printing layers um in between that one is a three layer and then this other one is just um a lino cut called stained um yeah pattern body contorted figures this is some early ceramic work that I did. Um, I have still difficulty with wheel throwing, but I definitely really struggled with it at first. So I couldn't really make anything big, but I was immediately very taken with Scraffito, um, which is the process that I use and now currently use to um, decorate all my pieces. Um, it's also like kind of similar to lino cut in terms of like being really like physically engaging and like tactile. So I really enjoy it. Um, I love ceramics. I feel like it has become as central to my art practice as drawing has been. And that feels really cool. And I think I'm doing more of it at Alchemy than I am printmaking, which is kind of interesting. Um, I also like being able to see myself improve. Like it's just when you're so new at something and you actually work at it the like margins of improvement feel a lot bigger versus like trying to improve my drawing feels like it's like less tangible so um this is a huge well I don't know I guess it's like this big I was gonna bring it and then I forgot <laughs> um but it's called um it's a huge strawberry planter that Soli who was a previous resident at Alchemy wheel through and then I scraffitoed um the piece is called Reckoning um we made it last year and yeah just like super motif heavy you've got the hands you've got the like faces in profile you've got the like naked women with the animal heads again so um yeah I really enjoyed making this it was pretty challenging because I couldn't just like hold it in my lap the way that I would all of those things over there um I had to like I don't know it just it just was challenging like it it took a long time um but Soli is a master craftsman and I really enjoyed working with her um, these are some paintings I did this winter from the 100 drawings class, um, which is something that Alchemy does every year. Yeah. Every year. Um, they are just black watercolor paint on paper. Um, I did not finish. I did 60. <laughs> Maybe I'll finish them this winter. Um, but yeah, I, again, coming back to kind of like the more personal element of my artwork and like my art as a container for emotion, I had a pretty rough winter. I had like a lot of pain that I didn't really know what to do with. Um, and so I feel like these paintings ended up taking like a lot of that emotion. And I'm actually really pleased with the way that they turned out. And I'm interested to do more um, work in this style in the future because um, tone becomes so important when you're not using multiple different colors. So um, yes. Uh, here is just like a little bit more like classic Cosette illustration from this winter. Um, this piece is called Hold You. 
It's um, watercolor with colored pencil, pencil layered over it. And then, yeah, again, like pattern around the edges. And then that's just a self-portrait that I did with pens that I got for Christmas. Um, yeah, and it just, I don't know. I just, I feel like it, I, I'm so glad to have had, to have ended up at Alchemy and to like be in a space where I'm prioritizing my art practice so much because I don't really know like what else I'd be doing like I feel like if I was working like a graphic design job my like soul would just be like really like pruney right now <laughs> so yeah this just kind of feels like very meaningful oh. okay um and then this year I've mostly just been making work to sell which um isn't quite as personal as some of the other art that I've showed you but it helps me survive so I I do and I do enjoy it and it's really nice to like have people connect with the work that I make um so a lot of screen printing and then just some tiny block prints I'd like to get further into block printing this winter um lots of spiky shapes on clothes yeah usually like two layer screens but sometimes I'll do three or four if I'm feeling a little crazy um and then yeah I feel like like this year also just like been really like pounding out the ceramics both because I like it and because people at the farmer's market will buy them <laughs> mm -hmm. so um I've been experimenting with like glaze combos and like striping on the inside of my pieces and it takes a lot longer and it doesn't always work but I do really enjoy how you can have like the internal and external pattern from two to like completely different types of glazing um and I feel like Scraffito is such like a wonderful medium because it's actually like, it's very time consuming, but it's quite simple because you're only working with like one color or two colors, I guess, or like positive and negative space and like line work. So that makes my like desire to just like layer color over and over and over again, like impossible. Mm -hmm. So love Scraffito. Um, here's a little bit more of my stuff. A lot of it is over on that table. If anyone would like to check it out all for sale um <laughs> no pressure also um and yeah like again people motif flowers hands faces thanks <laughs> did anyone have any questions yeah you mentioned earlier that a lot of your early figure drawings hands were behind the back is, is yeah there a reason for that maybe beyond that hands are hard well i don't know maybe i just knew that i'd end up making so many of them in the future <laughs> like i was like yeah i'm like i'm gonna conserve my like hand drawing and I, I don't know that's like a really good question i think it was as simple as drawing hands are hard but then i had like a pivot point in like mid high school where i was like i have to improve like i just i and then i like made myself draw hands and now i really like drawing them drawing feet however <laughs> still haven't figured that one out and also I don't really think that people would connect as much with like <laughs> like feet wrapping around the mud as they would with like hands it's not a prize. Oh, Adrian wants a foot <laughs> but yeah thanks for the question Nico sorry if I didn't answer it anyone else yeah oh uh scraffito such a fun word yes I've never heard that before but yeah. Like, what is that? Yeah. So scraffito is like a ceramic decoration technique. Um, I would assume it's from Italy. I think it's Italian. Devin says yes. Um, yeah. Basically, the the way that I the way that I have been taught how to scraffito is by um like wheel throwing or you know like hand building your vessel and then you can wait until it dries out a little bit and then you paint colored clay which is called underglaze onto it let it dry out a little bit more and then when it's leather hard um which is just like the right texture i don't know how to like describe it other than that you can um scrape it away with carving tools into whatever like figure you have or design and then you fire it in the kiln it's really fun and it's also it takes a freaking long time mm -hmm. it's super time consuming because you're scraping away all of the negative space you know mm -hmm. so it's a little stupid <laughs> and you kind of have like a time yeah. frame too, right? yeah so exactly too far 
it it gets too dry and then you're just like it's like scraping chalk off of something and it's like and like cracking and it looks really bad and it's not fun it's also like you can't really go back no you can't go back yeah yeah it's like all or nothing baby like a weird line (laughs) in front of it yeah yeah i also think that like uh, it's so easy when you draw to get so attached to like being able to erase your mistakes and like I don't really like pre-draw anything on my pieces. I just do it and like not being super attached to like something looking really correct or like anatomically accurate has been kind of freeing. And I think also the fact that it's like 3D and it's like wrapping around something mm-hmm. usual is like really awesome. But yeah, letting go of that desire is good. Charlie, do you feel like... um your connection with scraffito also connects to crummy game because it's kind of like the same yeah yeah absolutely yeah I mean I I learned how to do lino cut last year and I haven't at all done as much of it as I would like to but yeah I feel like it being so um tactile and like textural um and the process of like taking something away feels really really great and then that, that what I haven't quite, I feel like with Scurfito, I like very easily can like envision what's going to be left, but I haven't quite gotten to that point with Lino Cut yet where I like can know like, oh, like I can't see it. So I have to like stay in the blocks usually, yeah. but yeah. Well, thanks everyone. <laughs> wow. Cool. Thanks everyone for being uh, present at this amazing artist talk. This was so fun. I loved everybody's work and everybody's talks were so really amazing and just very inspirational. Um, we have one more artist talk uh, at the end of October on the last Saturday or last Sunday of October. So stay tuned for that. And I hope to see you back in this upstairs room with the IMA for one last talk of the year. And there's also an Alchemy Art Center staff show up at the community theater right now where you can see some of the work of Cosette, um, as well as me and Katie and Nico and somebody else here who works out right now. Um, and that's pretty much all the people who are here and Maria and Evan and, and Casey. Um, so it's a really fun show and it's just up in the lobby. So check it out. We also have lots of classes going on right now. Thanks, everyone.